Thank you very much. Uh, Rachel, first, um, you talked about communities this morning as uh, the new institutions, the new institutions who actually house distributed power in the future. Now we heard an account more of communities as sometimes supporting big corporations or being actually devoided of the power of, of acting through labor or ownership. Uh, do you think that community is just a transitional moment, a transformation, matter of transformation, or community have actually act in a political or another, another way to take conscience of themselves and to, be, to, to build themselves up actually power communities? Sorry, I'm being very British and drinking tea on stage, but um, I think it actually comes back to some of the structural questions that we've been talking about, that when pyramids sit on the top of communities and it's not really a connected community, it's kind of um, a community with an institution controlling it, you quickly move from a model of empowerment to exploitation. And that line is very thin. Um, and it's my worry not when um, just institutions sit or big companies sit on the top of communities, so Amazon with Mechanical Turk, but how we even prevent some of sort of the micro labor communities such as TaskRabbit um, actually getting into the area of exploitation and not empowerment. So um, I think it's a really important question to raise because you can make the natural assumption that distributed communities are better than hierarchical institutions. But distributed communities are not better than hierarchical institutions if they don't solve many of the inequalities and power struggles that pyramid institutions can also create. So um, getting the DNA, figuring out this tension between the center and the network um, is a really, really tricky question. So, you know, my worry is basically uh, in relation, also in response to your talk this morning, is that my worry is about uh, this, this vision of the future that so many economists right now share, including your very own uh, uh, Piketty, right? Uh, that you create basically a sort of, you, you wipe out the middle class, right? So, and you have this super class that I mentioned and these like super low paid workers. And how do you do this, right? With interfaces like, like Mechanical Turk, but also by de-skilling workers. And how do you do that? Uh, by destroying education. And how do you destroy education? In my opinion, through things like Coursera. So uh, where basically people are clearly less educated, uh, education goes down the hill, and what you have is basically elite institutions that will produce fantastically skilled and educated people, and then you have the masses that are un educated online. This is a little overgeneralized here, but it goes in the right direction, I think. How is that for a provocation? Okay, so for you, education is uh, uh, online education and MOOCs are not the problem, that are not the solution to educate masses and to reduce inequalities. And I'm also question, asking the question to Rachel. Well, I, didn't, I, can, I yeah. can answer that in great It's like, well, it depends, it's again about this language question, but, uh, you know, if, it depends on what you think by, about MOOCs, right? If you think about the 90s origin of MOOCs, which was wonderfully and open and peer-to-peer uh, -peer learning, uh, or you think the monetized, financialized, corporatized version that was created through places like Coursera and others. Uh, yeah, I do oppose that. I think it's a terrible idea. Rachel, your thoughts on education and distributed one? Um, I don't think MOOCs are a terrible idea. Um, I think they're in their infancy, but I share concerns over quality control and I share concerns, and this is why I said, you know, we've got to be really careful that um, we're not talking about the complete demise of institutions because even models like Coursera, um, the universities provide a really important form of supply to the community. And so where, if the institution goes away completely and we go to a totally open online model, um, the quality and the development of 
thought leadership and academia and how that finds a new home, I think is a really interesting question. Um, and so, you know, the physical institution as well, I mean, we feel it here today, like being together in person, interacting face to face has a really important role in society. So again, it's my interest is in this tension between the role of the institution and how it can actually fee quality um, in all dimensions of the word to the connected community. But what interests me about the MOOCs and other forms of connected communities is the reach and the democratization of the access. And that's where I think it's really difficult for me to say I don't believe in Coursera because um, the democratization of the access around the learning, and not just with Coursera, I think examples like Stack Overflow are really interesting, and Khan Academy are really interesting. Um, you know, Coursera isn't the answer, but a portfolio of learning communities where you can have very different learning experiences, where you can learn from a global community and then you can have a hyper-local, in-person experience at General Assembly, that's what interests me. So. Yeah, so that the question of complementarity between traditional ways of working and doing education and new ways who open access but don't solve any questions. Um, Nicolas, um, you, you, like, you, you talked about um, the, the, con the, the confrontation between the old world and the ancient world, the new world and the ancient world. Uh, your report of fiscal law, uh, fiscal digital law, which had been really remarked, um, one of the things that is at the center of your report is the free work, the question of free work and free and voluntary work, which is actually the personal data. That in, in the sharing economy question is very linked to the technology critics. Um, for you, um, what are today the solutions, private and public, uh, to accompany this transition and to make, take the best of the sharing economy and the access Rachel was talking about without liking, um, bearing the consequences which could be like horrible, like Trevor has, has shown it? Well, if you go back to Mechanical Turk and other examples uh, resembling Mechanical Turk, it, um, it's obvious part of the value created by technology is its ability to divide work into micro tasks that can be accomplished by uh, individuals on their spare time, uh, which means that, um, and, and this division uh, reduce the, val the, indiv the value created at the indiv individual level to the point that um, it can be so small, it's not worth uh, paying you for that because it's too small. Um, what we did in the report about taxation in the digital economy was um, we tried to, actually I prepared the lists of all the terms that you saw on the screens uh, uh, before for that uh, purpose to explain that it's really how it works except we, didn't, we don't have a term to explain it to politicians. So we forged the term free work to provoke to make sure that they will to, to have their attention. It's basically we, uh, the French people, are working for those big, giant American companies, creating value for them, seeing the value in their profits, and they don't pay, and not only they don't pay us for this work, but they don't pay the taxes on their benefits. So the idea is the task can be so small that it's not worth paying the individual. But uh, at scale, uh, millions of people working together creates value that could generate tax uh, revenue and help pay for uh, social insurance or public services or basic infrastructures that help people connect and spare the time to be online and to generate data that is on, and data is only a proxy to reveal that reveals the work that's done by everyone while using Google search or Facebook or, Ama or browsing products on Amazon and so on and so on. Basically the problem is not only are we, we're not paid for this, but there's no taxes paid for, paid based on it. So 
we don't get the value in any way, uh, nor uh, through the form of personal income, neither uh, under the form of uh, public spending, basically. Yeah. That, I, what, what you're saying in the end of your report is that basically there's no, the, all the solutions are quite tricky because we need some collaboration between not only like inside the public institutions, but also with, with all the countries because technology is so distributed that you couldn't just see the value and the restructuring of the value chain had to be accompanied by, by a new sort of governance that, it, that implicates more just one country. Um, so, so it's getting a little bit political here. So, um, and, and a question also of power. And Trevor, you, will, uh, you, you wanted to react, I think. Yeah, I do. Because uh, I think I completely uh, agree with you. I think it's all really amazing uh, observation. And I love the French tax proposal. Um, I, was, uh, th I think they got very worried about this. I think there was an immediate meeting between Google and uh, the French government uh, right, uh, following that. Uh, but I just wanted to think that maybe this argument that also Michael Bowens and other made that there is no general, no uh, value generated because it is so minute uh, has actually also changed in the last one or two years where now, uh, you know, Facebook's revenue has tripled in the last quarter through advertising, which would be directly related to the user. And Google reports that it makes between six, six and $500 per user per year, between six and $500 per year. That's uh, significant even if you just look at the single user uh, and you know also like you mentioned the basic income which is also one of the responses that I would suggest uh, you know there's some hope there as well with Switzerland briefly uh, leading the, the task you know well I have something to say about basic income it's a, a solution put, put forward by a lot of people observing that it's harder and harder to pay us for the work, for the value we create while clicking and writing online and using the applications online. And one of the solutions put forward is basic income. So if we can't pay you, at least the state can pay you a basic income. Uh, there's a need not to forget that basic income basically already exists under the form of powerful tools that are social insurance. Well, in France, it's called Sécurité Sociale. In the US, it's uh, Social Security and Medicare and the new Obamacare uh, system. Basically, it's providing income when the people need it the most, when they're sick, when they're old, when they have little children, small children. Uh, so it works, basically. And maybe before working on a new system that would be the basic incomes, we have to make sure that all this system that worked for decades, for centuries uh, in some cases, should be funded and, but it can't be funded if all the value ex escapes the territory and ends up in the accounts of uh, foreign corporations located in uh, tax havens. Rachel, what do you think about revenue, uh, basic income? Do you think it's, it, would solve, uh, it would be a good solution to, uh, to the discrepancy between value production and employment? Yeah, I mean, I think we've got to get beyond the conversation of micro labor and really talk about micro-entrepreneurship. I mean, one of the things that excites me about the most about this economy and when you actually spend time with the users is they often talk about how it's one of the easiest ways to become an entrepreneur. Um, I don't mean starting a business. I mean being a host, being a driver. And what they say is that when they have a taste of entrepreneurship, it's not about then becoming a rabbit or becoming a host. It's often, um, you know, they, I know it can sound evangelical because you're shaking your head and I haven't even finished, but um, they do say like their lens on the world changes. Like they realize that they do have assets that they can make money from, but also be connected to communities in a really different way. And I think there's one or two groups that rarely get talked about in the conversation that are extremely important. And that's the elderly, and that's stay-at-home mums or parents. So groups that are often isolated or undervalued in society, um, this economy has huge potential, not just in terms of monetary value creation, but actually reconnecting them to neighborhoods and social structures where they were previously isolated. And 
So it's not necessarily about the direct value they get from that one exchange. What they often say is they feel a reconnection that then shifts their behavior or shifts their interaction um, with their community. But Sarah, like, I don't want to, you know, go push this too far, but like, I mean, isn't this just the neoliberal idea of self-entrepreneurship that should be totally rejected? I mean, like, this basically where we all say, like, we are just all entrepreneurs now, and we are just all in it for ourselves, against and with others, whatever. Take TaskRabbit, right? So TaskRabbit, like, works, you know, just fine for a young, energetic person that sort of goes out every day and goes from task to task. But it also assumes that you never get sick. It also assumes that you never get old. It also assumes that you basically just, like, on the run all day, and you can do this perpetually without health insurance. This is just a total affront to all the labor struggles that people have fought for for, for hundreds of years, you know? Like for the eight hour workday, for health insurance, it's all wiped out by this stuff, you know? I mean, so I'm sorry, you know, I can't, I can't but, share this at all. But no this is the, the reason why a developing entrepreneurship should go along with developing social insurance, empowering social insurance. You can have a more entrepreneurial society if you don't have more powerful and better funded social insurances. That's one of the findings of the launch of Obamacare in the US. It's that people suddenly, because they're covered, are quitting their job to create their own company because they don't fear uh, ending up without uh, health coverage anymore. So. But what you described in terms of this sort of wonderful, I mean, at least for the United States, you know, what you described in terms of benefits really doesn't exist. Sure, there's social insurance, uh, there's Obamacare, but Obamacare really only kicks in if you get really, really sick. It do, you pay a fortune for the everyday stuff. You know, people are everything American but problem. protected. Everything but protected. But it works better here in France. Yeah. Well, France is, a, of course, a better society. <laughs> Um, I, I feel like we've gone into a, a one direction of labor, but just yes. to um, respond to a couple of things that you said, I mean, I would argue there are many companies that exploit their employees and you not, do not take care of them in far worse ways than you see. You know, when you, meet, when you know the founders of these companies, yeah, they haven't figured it out, but it's very much top of mind, like how do they develop a new benefit structure? How, what's their role around liability? It's not like they're devoiding themselves of responsibility. Whereas if you speak to many big corporates with factories and they are trying to devoid the responsibility. So again, I think it's, we have to keep reminding ourselves this is really a baby. It's four to five years old and we're expecting all these answers before we've even tried it. So, um, but the second thing I'd say is you don't meet many people who um, quit their whole life to become, you know, super sharers. Um, it's, oh, and that may change. It's often an addition, an enhancement, a supplement. Um, it's often underemployed people, unemployed people that don't have choices. And what you hear is that this is a way back in for so many different people. This is, and that is really important because when you speak to people who've been unemployed for two years or when you speak to an elderly person that no one's spoken to in a month or a stay-at-home mum that can't figure out how to go back to work, just being engaged again in society, the, the money's almost irrelevant to them. Maybe because also they took this, uh, this opportunity because there are, there are many other responsibilities. We couldn't maybe like put inequalities, rising inequality that Piketty has very well shown in his last book on only showing economy. It's only maybe a symptom, all that. What, what do you think, David? Do you think that uh, we could put all this, <laughs> sorry, uh, all, all the responsibility of the sharing economy on the collaboration or other, may, maybe other factors? And should we also, why does the community, the, 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 the better equipped tomorrow to, uh, to, to not have these like, consequences and to fight against them? Well, it's not so easy to answer your question, but what I would say that we need to be uh, alert and to be open to experimentations. And I think the debate here, uh, reveals that things are not uh, black or white and probably we find it difficult to find our way in this new reality and probably one thing that would help us is to uh, be open to experiments but at the same time 
it's uh, what, what's difficult with this uh, posture is that once the experiments are uh, under uh, are led, probably it's likely that someone holds a position which is after very difficult to uh, criticize or to nuance. So it's not, I, I, don't, I don't have a final answer, unfortunately, but I would say that we sh could, let's say, navigate between uh, foster experimentations and be transparent on those experimentations and to, uh, for them to be open to reverse actions and not to open, uh, let's say, uh, final positions for players that would uh, uh, gain a definitive position on a, on, a, on a topic or on a vertical. Um, thank you very much. The time's up. Thank you very much for your uh, participation. And uh, I give the microphone to the next MC.